The wall has to come down. This wall is a punitive wall. It, it is one of the most horrible, uh, repugnant expressions of power and control and separation and annexation. It is really an apartheid wall. It just looks, if you look at it and it's so gray and, and foreboding and ugly, it's something that has to come down. Uh, it's again a unilateral measure. Building walls between peoples is, is really a way of preparing for further distrust, hostilities and conflict and violence. So I think it should go down precisely because it's built on Palestinian land. It's not even built on the borders. And it, not only does it deprive us of our freedom, of our horizon, of our right to see beyond the, the wall, the here and now, it also imprisons the Israelis behind that wall and prevents them from seeing the consequences of the occupation of what's happening to the Palestinians and therefore they lack the tools of de dealing with reality. So it has to come down. The settlements of course are illegal. There is no such thing as a legal settlement because a settlement is a, a, a process of colonization, of land theft, of expulsion, what uh, uh, Elan Pape called the displacement replacement paradigm. You displace a whole nation and you replace it with another and you take their land, you take their resources including water, and now they're confiscating our culture as well, uh, in addition to expelling Palestinian people. So we know we will not accept the, the displacement-replacement paradigm. We will not accept the expulsion and ID uh, revocation or confiscation of Palestinians. And we will not accept the superimposition of an illegal reality on our territory based on land theft and importation of populations into Palestine. The settlements have to be dismantled. If there are Israelis who want to be, uh, who want to stay in Palestine as individuals, they may apply in accordance with our uh, laws of immigration and naturalization. The state of Palestine would be occupied, and the state of Palestine would simply be calling, negotiating how its occupying power is going to leave. If Israeli settlers would be interested in staying, well, as I've heard many times mentioned by other people, they can apply through the immigration, naturalization, and <laughs> procedures that would exist within a Palestinian state. And according to whatever these procedure, whatever procedures are, they can either be allowed to stay or not. How would refugees fare? if Palestine becomes an independent state? And how would it affect the Palestinian citizens of Israel? Now, Palestinians are, you know, divided into those who live in the West Bank and Gaza, some of whom are refugees and some of whom are from there. Those who live in, uh, in, 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 in the part of historic Palestine that became Israel as, as yet another group and those living in the other Arab countries. A two-state solution based on the 1967 lines is one that addresses some of the grievance, some of the needs and interests of the population living in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. It would only indirectly deal and help the, deal with and help the Palestinians who are refugees in other Arab countries. And it does nothing for the Palestinians living inside Israel. So it's not surprising that those for whom the two-state solution does not directly address their grievance will not be enthusiastic about it. دولة وهمية فيش في إلها أي مقاومات حياة فيش ده شو الحدود عباء عن جضاء كونتينات سجون جماعية على إيش يثبت هذا إنها في دولة فلسطين. And this is also another important to realize thing to realize everything Israel has done for example since 1948 and then again since 1967 or continued after 1967 is to make the partition of Palestine impossible and to create facts on the ground which make Israeli domination irreversible. This is really, really important. That's why the boycott, divestment, and sanctions are so important. Because everything Israel does is to make it so that the Israeli domination of the entire land and the people 
is irreversible. And then, of course, when you see it in that light, you understand the ethnic cleansing, and you understand the brutal policies against the Palestinians. Everything suddenly makes sense when you see it in that light, and you understand the real purpose behind what they're doing. Um, so how the UN votes, I think, is immaterial. I think it might be symbolically, could be, could be seen as a Palestinian victory if the vote goes for the Palestinians. So Israel will probably consider it as a, as a, a victory if, if the vote goes their way. But on the ground, in terms of how Palestinians are treated, in terms of resolving the Israeli-Palestinian issue, this is completely insignificant. Let's, let's allow ourselves to dream for a minute. Let's imagine that on September 20th, Mahmoud Abbas hands an application to Ban Ki-moon, who takes it over to the Security Council for full membership for the State of Palestine. Let's imagine that the Security Council discusses this, and none of the permanent members opposes it. And it sails through somehow. And actually, Palestine, let's imagine, were to become a full member of the United Nations, because then when the vote goes to the General Assembly, a two-thirds majority in the General Assembly will be smooth sailing. It's not, a, it's not going to be hard to get two-thirds majority in the General Assembly. What can Palestinians hope to gain from this? Because they haven't gotten their state. Yeah? They only got themselves a, a place uh, in, in an international body. Of the many things that they can gain, one I'd like to highlight. The meaning of the negotiations at that point instantly shifts. Now, it will be two states engaged in negotiation, in a sense, once the whole world has recognized that Palestine is a state within the 1967 borders, Israel becomes recognized as a country that's occupying the territory of another member state. And while there will be negotiations, and I think there should be negotiations, the negotiations will be about the mechanics and the mechanisms of withdrawal, and there will be no ambiguity that it is that Palestinians have veto power over any, over, over swaps, yeah? If Israelis feel strongly, and I know Israelis feel very strongly, about the Jewish holy sites in the old city, which were occupied in 1967, I think that's a genuine issue that the Israelis have a genuine interest in, and Palestinians would have to find a means of accommodating the Israeli interest in that. But that would be entirely different from the vegetable market scenario we have witnessed for 20 years. It's, it's worth thinking about what the concern of some Palestinians are about uh, not going ahead with uh, full UN member status. It seems that either it's a stunt that doesn't do any concrete good or more significantly that it could surrender issues of the full right of return and even a broader uh, Palestinian state. It seems to me that both of those objections are misplaced. Uh, first of all, the easy one, a stunt, well, they need to do symbolic things. Uh, to me, this should have been something that was pursued by the Palestinian Authority years ago. I think they made a mistake really counting on a bilateral process with Israel and counting on the U.S. support. So the fact that uh, President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority is finally willing to kind of challenge the United States and Israel is a very important step, I think. Uh, so the Palestinian community needs to push more accountability from President Abbas and the Palestinian Authority. So it's helped it. So. It, it may be a stunt, but it's a very useful stunt that has exciting possibilities. In terms of you know, the broader issue of surrendering the right of return, I don't, I don't see that there's any uh, incompatibility between going for what's a widespread uh, international consensus of let's at least start with a two-state solution based on the 1967 borders, understanding that that's not the end game. I've heard people saying 
you know, what's the point getting a Palestinian state recognized in the UN? That won't give us a state on the ground. Yes, it's true, it won't. But there is such a thing as legal reality. Yeah? We can, we can speak just as, as, as corporations are legal persons. Yeah, they're not really persons, like they're not natural persons, they're legal persons. Similarly, and that gives them a reality in the world that they wouldn't have if they were not recognized as legal persons. Similarly, there is a legal reality that can be given to Palestine as a state if it is a full member of the United, of the United Nations that it wouldn't have if it is not. We're talking here symbolic, we're talking one step, but it would, be a, it would have been a step or would be a step in the right direction if you value a two-state solution. If you think a two-state solution was disastrous and you think it should have never been a, a Palestinian political platform, then you might celebrate the fact that the United, Na the United States will be vetoing this and will stop Palestine from becoming a member of the UN. I find that sad, but I know that that's the case for some people. Yeah. For the Palestinians, efforts to delegitimize Israel will end in failure. Symbolic actions to isolate Israel at the United Nations in September won't create an independent state. The administration views uh, the effort, the Palestinian effort at the UN as an effort to de delegitimize Israel. Could you explain to us why such an effort or such a move would delegitimize the state of Israel? Uh, again, I think you know where we stand on this issue. I don't think I can improve on the comments that we've made from this podium over the last week that the secretary herself has made, that the president has made, that we think the best way forward for these parties is to come back to the table and negotiate this through. I guess what I'm trying to do is really explain to my readers as to why this is viewed as a process to delegitimize the state. So could you just help me understand as to why is it perceived as such? As we said a number of times, uh, the day after any action in the, in the UN, you haven't changed the fundamental situation. And what we are seeking to do is to get to a place where we can have two states living side by side in peace and security. And action in New York is not going to achieve that objective, as we said many times. The United States believes that negotiations should result in two states with permanent Palestinian borders with Israel, Jordan, and Egypt, and permanent Israeli borders with Palestine. We believe the borders of Israel and Palestine should be based on the 1967 lines with mutually agreed swaps so that secure and recognized borders are established for both states. The Palestinian people must have the right to govern themselves and reach their full potential in a sovereign and contiguous state. Now, irrationality is not uncommon in politics. Yeah? Contradiction is not uncommon in politics. But sometimes the irrationality and the contradiction is so blatant that even the casual observer cannot miss it. And I think this is going to be one of those instances. President Obama gives a speech in May saying that the parameters of an Israeli-Palestinian peace are on the basis of the 1967 lines with agreed upon land swaps. He comes, he comes and makes that statement himself. He says that's the standard. Palestinians take him at his word and say, okay, we're asking for no more. Merely the recognition of a state of Palestine on the basis of the 1967 borders. And if you want to put in brackets with agreed you know, with agreed land swaps, we can do that. How does the United States justify to itself, to the world, just, I mean, in, their, in, in, in policymakers, how do they justify in their own heads how they veto their own statements? How do you veto your own position? How do you vote against what you yourself proposed? The problem is the two-state solution is an unjust solution, but still we can't even get there. 
that's how ridiculous and surreal everything um, is. So, when Palestinians ask for a state for full membership of a Palestine of Palestine in the United Nations on the borders of 1967, they are asking for what the whole world agrees they should have. Even the United States, even those who will vote against them, agree. That's the weirdness of it. Well, my dream is to have an independent country of Palestine, to be admitted to the United Nations as hopefully we have 193 countries now. Wouldn't it be nice if the UN General Assembly voted to grant statehood and Palestine would become that 194th country in the world? Starting in January 2011, I have not known in my memory, and I don't think in the memory of my parents' generation, I don't think they have known the whole world looking at the Arab world in admiration. I have not felt that in my life. That level, that sense that the world truly admires us. The world thinks we're do not only we're doing something right, the world can be inspired by what Arabs are doing. To, to see demonstrators in the streets of Tel Aviv saying we were inspired by the Arab Spring, who thought they, could ever, they would ever hear that? This is a very unusual moment in modern Arab history. This is the moment of empowerment and dignity. When Palestinians who share in that sense, even though they haven't had their own Arab Spring, they haven't had their own popular movement in this last year. Of course, Palestinians have had many popular movements. They had it in 36, they had it in 87, they had it in 2000. But now they're not, they haven't participated in this in any big way. But they participate in the feeling. They share in that sense of pride and dignity that is shared by everybody who feels connected to the Arabic-speaking world. In this atmosphere, to make a demand for one's rights, to say, we, whom the world admires, we stand with dignity, demanding our right. We're not asking for a handout, not asking for charity. We stand with pride and dignity, asking for what is ours, what all of you have acknowledged for years is ours. We demand it now. That moment is not going to be recreated. And on September 20th, I'm waiting for that moment. Me and my family and my friends and my acquaintances were waiting for that moment. And I hope and I pray God that it will happen. Because we deserve it. In October 2011, those waiting for the moment when the UN recognizes Palestine were disappointed when the vote in the Security Council was set aside indefinitely. We applaud the step President Abbas took by heading to the UN to announce the state of Palestine. It is a daring step. I am with the decision of President Abbas to go and demand the state in September. But I feel some fears and hesitations in the streets about his going to the UN. I believe this is the correct choice and we are all have to comply without hesitation to go to the UN. Of course, we the Palestinian people have to support the president. May God keep and guide him and we wish him all the success in every step he takes for the benefit of the Palestinian people. Any direction Palestinian politics takes towards the UN to demand a state is only one of the solutions at this stage we may accept. The September Accord is overdue, but it's only that overdue, because we are paying an exorbitant price by acknowledging the state within 1967 boundaries. Since that means we will forget for a period of time a large portion of our lost paradise.
History will determine the length of this period in exchange for the paradise that we will lose if we do not move seriously toward declaration of a state. I am with the President in this effort since the Palestinian people and leadership have tried everything. Resistance, negotiations with Israel, nothing works. It is time now to go to the UN and demand recognition of a Palestinian state. So I am with this step and I support it all the way. Asking for the 67 borders or a state of cantons, which are in reality collective prisons, from my perspective, I do not accept anything like that. I think this is all nonsense and advise the president not to go to the UN or any other place. I think the Palestinians were hurt by both not being completely on board, so there being some divisiveness within the Palestinians on whether this was the way to go. I think if they had lobbied more strenuously, they might have had a chance, particularly to get a country like Bosnia and maybe, maybe even Portugal to have gone along. So both the U.S. having a continuing influence in the Security Council and the Palestinians not being 100 percent behind this initiative explains why they only got to eight. On the other hand, it was surprising and kind of a symbolic victory for the Palestinians that the United States was not able to secure no votes from uh, any of the states they wanted, uh, including Germany. So Germany wouldn't vote no. So a lot of these states abstained instead of voting no. So I'd say it's a mixed bag. The bottom line, however, is that we knew that they weren't going to get a Security Council approval because we knew the United States was going to veto it. So the next step was going to be the UN General Assembly. The UN General Assembly then eventually would have voted overwhelmingly, probably around 150 states would have voted to have given something that we could call a super observer status. So something in between a full member and uh, this, the old observer status it had, so an upgrade in rank. Although the bid for recognition in the UN Security Council did not succeed, on October 31, 2011, the United Nations voted overwhelmingly to admit Palestine to UNESCO. And the UNESCO vote was a pretty good victory for the Palestinian Authority. They got overwhelming membership to uh, be sort of a full member of UNESCO. And since we're really just talking about a legitimacy battle, not so much a concrete battle, I think um, that really sort of shows the writing on the wall that the Palestinian cause enjoys a lot of legitimacy. So on the whole, I think the decision to go ahead with the Palestinian Authority bid for full membership was a good decision, knowing that they weren't going, to, this wasn't going to create a state for them, this wasn't going to get rid of the Israeli occupation, it wasn't going to immediately change U.S. policy, but it was going to add leverage, and so I think that's proceeding as well as could be expected. The best end game is let's get two states, make sure it's really based on the 1967 borders and the settlements are withdrawn, and think about how to improve the lives of all citizens in the state of Israel and in the new state of Palestine. So I, I see the best model, and rather than talking about a one-state solution, which is not feasible anytime soon versus a two-state solution. Think about what one does after getting a two-state solution. And I think in Israel what that means is working for much more serious civil rights so you end the systematic discrimination against the Palestinians living in Israel. You start to build uh, more trust between the Jewish population and the Palestinian Arab population in Israel and think about uh, coming up with something that's not so much a Jewish state anymore, but an Israeli state that recognizes that it's got an important Jewish and Palestinian Arab component. So, you know, it has certain uh, symbolic significance both to Jewish culture and to Palestinian Arab culture. And if you think along those lines, you would get the best of what a one-state solution is calling for anyways, which is a more dignified life that's not 
proceeding on discriminatory treatment toward Palestinian Arabs. So I think that the two-state solution is a very important base, but the point is one should move beyond two-state versus one state and think about a more just two-state solution that would accommodate things like dealing with the refugee situation and dealing with the fundamental inequality faced by Palestinian Arabs within even the 1967 borders. I think we're on the verge of seeing that territorially uh, Israel is rendering the Palestinian state not viable because it is stealing more land, it is building more settlements or colonies, it is bringing in more Israeli settlers illegally, it is blurring the divide between the two states and it is destroying the viability, territorial viability of the Palestinian state. I still believe that if there is a political will and if there is the determination to intervene and to engage positively, we can still rescue the two-state solution. But it's a very slim chance because Israel has been given time and cover to continue with its destructive path. Now, if, if there is no will to, to act with a sense of urgency and immediacy, then it, se it seems to me the two-state solution, yes, will be destroyed. That means that we will stay in this very abnormal situation for generations, maybe, under occupation where Israel acts unilaterally, where it steals the land without the people. The one-state solution isn't going to emerge easily or as a result of a political program because Israel will reject it and will use its own logic of power to continue to create prejudicial facts uh, with the Palestinians, to take the land without the people as much as it wants to do that, and to expand Israel because Israel has no boundaries, has no constitution. It, it just expands as it goes along. So that is the real danger to peace, because without the two-state solution, there's going to be greater conflict, greater violence, greater extremism. Without a just resolution, of course, the whole region, if not the globe, will pay the price.